Now for our main sermon today by Mr. Bartimus Grayson, Who is God Calling? Over in Mark chapter 2, verses 16 through 17, the scribes and the Pharisees saw Jesus eating with publicans and sinners. And they said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with these tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it in verse 17, he said unto them, they that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. And he said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So you see that the title of this message is right there. That's going to be the answer to this. But these scribes and Pharisees, they knew the scriptures. They studied the scriptures. They taught the scriptures. But in many cases, they didn't practice them. In their own eyes, they did not see that they themselves were sinners and also in need of the Savior and by their attitude toward these publicans and sinners and Christ himself that they thought much too highly of themselves but it was on that occasion that the Son of Man that Jesus Christ our Lord and our Savior said at that time that he came to save sinners I came to call sinners to what unto repentance he called them to change their attitude he called them to turn their hearts and minds toward righteousness doing what is right pleasing God all in repentance from the sinful things they may have been thinking or or doing in their life now some of us have come out of dire straits before becoming converted and being baptized and accepting Jesus Christ as our Passover, as our, as our uh, sacrifice. And some came looking for peace of mind, some for freedom from bad habits and, and wrongdoing and guilt, some looking for real truth or the plain truth. And in our world today, with all the conveniences that we see around us, access to knowledge, hustle and bustle, Many are stressed out about the things they see and the things that are going on in our world, and we are all infected by it in some way. Still, <clears throat> some seeking to understand the purpose of life and why we are here. They might, might have everything settled, but then again, there's that question of where am I going from here? What does God want me to do? What is my purpose? Every one of us, I think, at times wonder about that. But whatever the motivation for our conversion and decision to believe in God and follow Christ as our Lord and our Savior, we are here today on the weekly Sabbath, of course, to find healing and rest and to renew our hope for the future in the kingdom of God. So we all desire, I'm sure, to be a better person, pleasing to the eternal so that we may inherit everlasting life but we slip and fall sometimes so <clears throat> being a better person sometimes is not always easy because of the things that go on around us that make us angry that make us have doubt that make us have suspicions in our lives along the way somehow the sometimes the ups and downs of life changes our course and we really can't go on in life like we want to. And we put off drawing near to God and we lose track of things. So instead of growing, we slack up and forget our commitment to doing the will of God. And we become less than when we first began. In eight days, we begin a new holy day season. We start with the Lord's Supper that connects us to the days of unleavened bread. We, uh, it's, we start looking to Christ as our Passover and the reason for our living and in whom all the holy days that come along surround. He centers around those, those feasts. 
In 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 through 4, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, wrote, To them that have obtained like precious faith with us, through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So it takes going into his word to knowing, uh, to gain the grace and the knowledge that is found in the scriptures. Grace and peace is found in that way. Verse 3, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. So God has given everything we need for living a godly life. You know, in today's world and modern conveniences like the automobiles we drive, it's got all those things that are going to provide for our doing good in that vehicle. Signals and, and buzzers and beeps and all, all those things. But from the word of God, we are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. When is the last time that we have looked to see what those things might be? That by these you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, through coveting, through wanting things that we should not uh, have our eye on. So we have been given great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable us to share in his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by our human nature and by human desires and the lust. So we don't want to lose track of what it means to partake of the bread and blood of Christ who is our Passover lamb. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul said, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So you want to be righteous. You want to look to the future knowing that you are qualifying for that kingdom of God. But be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of us. Such were some of you, Paul said. But the good news is, you are washed, you are sanctified, and you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So Jesus said, I did not come to call the righteous. I came to call sinners to repentance. And whatever that motivation was, we find ourselves today listening to the word of God, worship, uh, coming to worship on the Sabbath day. But why not the righteous? Because, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one, because we are all under sin. In Romans chapter 3, verse 9 through 18, and including verse 23, the Apostle Paul wrote, verse 9, We have proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. So every nation... Every race, every color, every ethnic group, every man, every woman, every person, young and old, is subject to sin, to the power of sin that it has in our life. So as we know, sin is a transgression of the law, Romans 6.23. And that law is the Ten Commandments. The Apostle Paul said, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust except that the law had said, you shall not covet. <clears throat> and also from Romans 3.19, he added, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, because all, your, all thy commandments, all of God's commandments are righteousness, and all unrighteousness we know is sin. Three-letter word that means a lot of big things. 
a lot of things, a lot of terrible things as we look about our world around us. Continue uh, Romans uh, chapter 3 verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understands, none that seeks after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that does good, no, not one. So he's emphasizing this after he makes that statement of one thing and then he uh, carries it with more emphasis. No, not one. Whose, uh, their throat is an open sepulcher, an open tomb. With their, dung, with their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of ass is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So when someone decides he wants to compromise, he wants to uh, go to the edge a little bit, that's because there is no fear of God. We've all been to that edge, I think, sometimes. But all have sinned, verse 23, and come short of the glory of God. So all of these things that happen to us, the sins that we have, the lusts that we have, is causing us to come short of the glory of God. Have we gone out of the way? So you look at our nation, our world around us, what do we see? We can close our ears, <coughs> ears to the evil around us. We can hide our eyes from the uh, evil we see. And we can say to ourselves, it just isn't so. We're doing okay. But the power behind sin is at work. It's Satan the devil whom he, seeking whom he may devour because he is the one who deceives the whole world. Makes it look good, makes it look palatable, makes it look like it's harmless, but it's a deception. So we know that sin is infectious. It goes around like a bad cold or flu or, or some other dread infection that needs to be treated. Luke 12, 1, Jesus said to his disciples, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. In Isaiah chapter 64, the prophet said in verse 6, We are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. So at this time of year, we know that we are to examine ourselves, to judge ourselves, to look ourselves over, because sin is all around us. Sin corrupts. It ruins lives. It causes misery, heartaches, sorrows, death. But how do we know that we have not been infected and it's just waiting to manifest itself in some way in our life? could be hiding in the corners of our mind. But the world outside, like the destroyer in Egypt during the Passover, if he did not see the blood painted around our dwellings, he would come in and destroy the firstborn to destroy lives. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. By the way, did uh, I pass out those? I usually pass out handouts. No one got a handout? <laughs> okay, that's all right. For 2 Corinthians 13, it says to examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. That's, how, that's what you're looking for. That's what you're taking into consideration. You're looking at yourself, whether you be in the faith. So prove your own selves, it says. Know ye not your own selves. How that Jesus Christ is in you, except... You be reprobate, rejected as counterfeit or disapproved in some way. So as we near the days of unleavened bread, we're going to be diligent in searching for every bit of leaven to cast out. As Exodus 12 and 19, it says that seven days there shall be no leaven found in your houses. For whosoever eats that which is leaven even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. No leaven shall be found 
in your houses. And whoever eats leaven shall be cut off from the congregation. So I think, you know, you do, you do your best to get rid of the living because it's a symbol of sin. Sometimes it's hard to do. But if there were some sort of police force that came to look our house over with a, a little old magnifying glass and flashlight and he's looking to find one little bit of leaven, uh, we would probably be done for. So how diligent will we be in cleaning out the uh, the leaven, but how diligent will we be clearing out our minds and our hearts of sinful thoughts and deeds? So no matter how diligent we may be in searching for this physical leaven, it's not going to be enough. But what the days of unleavened bread teaches us is that sin is all around, and we are to avoid sin by partaking of the words of Christ our Savior. So in life, <coughs> we need the righteousness of Christ to cover our sins. As one gets older, physical chores get harder. You can't get down on your knees and really search for the leaven like you want to. Or, and it's dangerous to climb up on a ladder, see if you got any leaven up there uh, on the shelf. I stay away from ladders. Once, when I fell, I thought, well, that's the last time. I've got to be careful. Uh, I have a secret to tell, but I'm not going to tell because Carolyn will wonder why. <laughs> but I will tell. We have a roof, uh, a ceiling that is as high as this. And it takes a long ladder to reach up there. And it started buzzing. She was gone that day, but it started warning. You know, there's, it started buzzing or something. I forgot, but I went out and got the ladder stretched it out to where it would reach and thought about that time that I fell off the ladder and uh, I took the the lid off of it I took the battery out and the battery's not there anymore so she said why didn't you call the fire department that's what she would tell me well I hate for them to come out and it might be like David that one time you don't want them to uh, turn on the sirens or anything the whole neighborhood looks to see what you're, uh, what's up in your house. So <clears throat> anyway, we do things, we, uh, these preventative things, but then sometimes when we really need it, we forget it. And uh, it's just like sin in our life. It comes along and sometimes there's a fire. And I hope, uh, anyway, go on. I'm in, I'm in trouble already. Romans chapter 7, verse 23. This is Paul speaking. I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Just like, you know, I'm going to just take that battery out of there and I won't have to worry about it anymore. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? from the body of this death. And I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So the answer is Jesus Christ, our Passover, the eternal Lord and Savior, whose blood is painted around the doorway to our life. Exodus twelve thirteen, And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. You know, if we were living at that day, we would be looking to that blood, to its promise to protect us from the destroyer. A couple of weeks ago, Pastor Matthew, Matthew Steele, he said once in a sermon, we are like walking doorposts covered in blood. That being the blood of Jesus Christ, our Passover sacrificed for us so wherever we go whatever we do whatever we say we need to remember that there is blood painted upon our dwellings and upon our thoughts the apostle paul spoke of the lord's supper and how we are to honor it in the right way as a memorial of christ's sacrifice as the lamb of god first corinthians chapter 11 23 
he referred to the Last Supper, this is Paul, he referred to the Last Supper as the Lord's Supper. And he said, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Now this is the night of the 14th of Nisan, day three of that week, which was a Tuesday night in our modern reckoning of, of the names of the days of the week. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, broke the bread and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Not literally, but a symbol that, that it would be his broken body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. So he's, he's the mediator of the new covenant. He entered into that holy place to obtain redemption for us. <clears throat> After the same manner, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's de death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, examine ourselves. <coughs> uh, for he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And the way we examine ourselves is just to see whether we are in the faith. Prove your own selves, he said. He that eats and drinks in, in, a, in an unworthy manner, that is, in a base or a dishonorable way, <coughs> eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning, not being clear-minded, and understanding about the meaning of what it meant for Jesus to go through the suffering and the pain in sacrifice for our sins. In the Bible Knowledge Commentary uh, by Wolverd and Zuck, it says these passages, uh, verses 27 through 29, quote, are intended to produce soul-searching introspection, end quote. And this we do in preparation for the Passover, being in the right frame of mind before we partake of the bread and wine. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12. Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it so we prepare our minds and our hearts because we have this promise that God is not going to tempt us above what we are able wherefore my dearly beloved flee from idol idolatry and I speak as to wise men judge you what I say and the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? That is what joins us in communion. When we look down at that uh, little glass of wine, we become one, the bread and the wine. We are in communion with Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. So all who drink this cup of blessing are sharing together the blessing of, the, of Christ's blood. And when we break off pieces of the bread from the loaf. To eat this shows that we are sharing together. In the benefits of his body and blood. So this memorial of the Lord's Supper and the sacraments. Jesus blessed on that night. Are for us to remember that he loved us. And gave his life for us. And there are many of us here and you know, around the world where we all eat from the same loaf, showing that we are all parts of the one body of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me. <clears throat> but not as though the bread and the cup are taken as literal body and blood of Christ. But it, that's what some churches believe. 
Matthew chapter 26, verse 26. It was a, a meal. It was a supper. <clears throat> and as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And so you may wonder, well, as the disciples looked at that blood, how is this? What's, what's he saying? What is, how is this his body? And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink you all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. His blood would be the payment for the disposal of our sins. He, it would be the ransom that he would pay. For the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many, including us in this many. At the Lord's Supper, and what Paul calls communion, we partake of that bread and wine. The wine represents the blood of the new covenant poured out for many, and it is his cup of blessing for us, when we see blood, you know, we, we think of life spilling out of us. If it's a major cut, you know, we see, well, we're going to need something to stem the flow. And it can be frightening in some cases. Because when I fell off that ladder that one time, I fell toward the piano stool, braced myself because the ground was closing in on me pretty quick. And I don't remember how I hit myself up around my forehead but I sat up and, and thought I felt warmth you know coming down the side of my face and my a granddaughter was there and she saw me and it must have frightened her too because I was bleeding that's the most I've bled and I don't know how long but anyway it can be a frightening thing and so this wine represents the blood of the new covenant covenant poured out for m many and when we look into that small glass of red wine, and many of us have different ways of, of studying that little glass of, of wine, but we are reminded of Christ's shed blood for the forgiveness of our sins. By his blood, he forgave my sins. By his shedding of blood, he paid the death penalty for my sins, for our sins, and he now saves us. We know that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness because as we heard earlier, life is in, in the blood. Adults have around 1.2 to 1.5 gallons of blood in their body. 7 to 10% of an adult's weight around 10 pints of blood. It depends on the size and weight uh, of, of the body of the person. Sheep have about 4.8 liters of blood. So there's a lot of life that comes out of the body. The life is in the blood and it's draining away. And Christ our Savior gave his life for us. In Ezekiel 18 verse uh, 20. He said that the soul that sins it shall die. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he has committed. And keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right. He shall surely live. He shall not die. All his transgressions that he has committed. They shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he has done. He shall live. So we see this great promise of, of our Lord. Of God our Father. And he said have I any pleasure at all in the death of the wicked. That the wicked should die. And not that he should return from his ways and live. That's he came to save sinners. And that's what he is that is is his purpose. To turn us from wicked ways and to live. Verse 31. Cast away from you all your transgressions. Whereby you have transgressed. Make you a new heart. And a new spirit for why will you die, O house of Israel? So earlier we talked about it. You look around at our country, at the world around us all over. And we see that big question. 
why will you die? Mark chapter 15, verse 33, 34. On the night of the 14th of Nisan, at supper, Jesus knew that his time had come. And he knew that he was going to fill the role of being the Passover lamb, the Passover lamb of God as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. And when he had passed around that bread and wine, he said he would no more drink of it until he returned. But he left it for us to partake of at the time of the days of unleavened bread. But then he was arrested. He went before Pilate. He was put to trial. He was mocked. He was bitten, beaten and scourged. And on that day, verse 33 tells us, when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. That's around 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. when Christ gave up his life and said, it is done. Now, in that cup of blessing, we see in its color, it reminds us of the broken body of Christ and his shed blood because of his broken body. He did this for our sake. He gave his life for our sake. His body was cut. His scalp pierced by that thorny crown pushed down upon his head. He was mocked, slapped across the face. His lips busted and bleeding. His face bruised. He was flogged with a lead tip whip. And then he was turned over to the soldiers to be crucified, to stumble and walk to Golgotha, where he was nailed, hands and feet, to that upright stake, that tree, that cross, as some call it. He was alive and bleeding. And by the time the soldiers came to break his leg, Jesus was already dead. And then, when the soldier stuck his spear into his side, blood and water and all that came from his side. It poured out, splashed. So that water and the blood that poured out was his life-given blood that we might live free from sin, made righteous before God. We drop on down to Romans 5, <coughs> chapter, verse 7 that is. Scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. Some would even dare to die. They, you know, I'll think about it. But then Christ didn't have to think about it. He paid the death penalty in our stead. And God commandeth his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. We weren't there to look at the cross. We weren't there to see Jesus. But on the cross he was thinking. Of those who would live to this day. As you and I have done so. Verse 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So he died, he was resurrected three days later, and he is at the right hand of our father. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, because it was the father's will that he who believes in Jesus Christ shall have eternal life by whom we have now received the atonement. So once a year we are to remember our covenant with Christ to follow him, to trust in him and remember that he came to save sinners as we once were. But keep in mind that that does not mean that we can continue to sin, that grace may abound until we come again the next year. Let us keep the feast, as Paul said, in sincerity and in truth. So the Lord's Supper and its sacra uh, sacraments remind us of the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as the Lamb of God. And it connects us to the seven days of unleavened bread and what it means to complete life's journey by avoiding 
the leaven of sin. So we've read a lot about sin and the body and blood of Christ and that we are also not perfect, that all have sin. Yet the scripture says to us, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Now that seems really far out of reach. How can that ever be? What is this talking about? Remember earlier, the scribes and the Pharisees, they were looking down on the publicans and sinners, and they were wrong. But the Pharisees taught that one should love those who were near and dear to them and salute their brethren only. Their enemies should be hated. That their, and that their hatred toward every sort of sinner meant that God hates them too. But God extends his love to everyone and he calls all to repent. Matthew 5 tells us, verse 43, you have heard that it has been said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love only them which love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the publicans the same. If you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. If your enemy thirsts, give him drink. If your enemy hungers, give him food. So God's standard of love <coughs> is perfect. And we can never meet his perfection in all things. <clears throat> but we can learn to love our neighbors. Romans chapter 3. We know that the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. They are irrevocable. He does not withdraw what he has given us or changes his mind to whom he gives his grace. So we press toward the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And we give diligence to make that calling and election sure. In closing, Romans 3, verse 22, or 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all come short, no matter how hard we want to try, but we have Christ as our righteousness. And we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ and his righteousness and his loving sacrifice for, for us. And I close with this, this scripture that we are all familiar with. Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you.